today I'm just going to talk about a, a large site that we've been digging since 2018, on and off through pandemics and various other bits and bobs of stoppages. Um, it's located. Uh, why isn't this working? Here we go. It's located between. Oops, uh, it's actually moved. Between, it's actually here. For some reason the slide has jumped. It's between Ship Street and uh, Chancery Lane. It's a large site. It's there's that square there should actually be down here. Um, it's fairly big, fairly deep. So there's a lot of material on it. So really, I'm just going to give a very brief run through today of of what we found so far. The first thing we did was to dig right around the edges of the site in advance of the second piling. Uh, we did this in trench boxes. It was actually a very valuable exercise. It produced a lot of very interesting and good information. And it also gave us like a test trench right the way around the site. So we had some good idea of the archaeology in the site before we actually got started. Now, the site lies wrapped around the church of St. Michael the Pole. And we'd hoped we'd get some early material relating to the church. Uh, a couple of things, though, stymied us somewhat. Uh, up in the north here, north half the site was actually occupied by the River Poddle. Um, it extended right down as far as here. And we had a huge amount of large and deep cellarage, 18th, 19th century cellars on the site. So the amount of actual dry land early material we had left was very, very small. The main area where we found early stuff was here was this rectangle on the back of these cellars. And in that area, there were <coughs> old clatter pits, post holes, and one curving gully, which seemed to be curving around uh, parallel with what would have been the enclosure, the early enclosure of the church. The post holes and things that we found were very similar to ones that had previously been found at church. Uh, we don't as yet have any dates. We're waiting on carbon dates from hearts and things for this material. In the northern half of the site, then we have the actual river puddle. Uh, this area here survived. Over the rest of the site, as I'll show you later, there were huge rock quarries dating to the 12th century, which had removed virtually everything earlier than them. In this small area up here, uh, we found the base of the river puddle. You can see it steps an unusual way due to the folding of the rock. There was about four meter depth of silt in the river. It produced a huge amount of fines. Uh, I'll show you some of them later. Um, the material at the bottom is probably 8th, 9th century, and the top silts are late 11th century. Uh, we found the remains of a body, uh, uh, an adolescent, 10, 12 years old, probably a young boy, wrapped in a shroud in the river. Part of his lower legs had actually washed away. Uh, this is interesting because Lindsay Simpson also found uh, burials of adolescents along beside the river in, in the Longfort, where she was digging further, further to the east. Now, in the probably the early 11th century, a large flood bank uh, was built in the river, just close to the actual edge uh, to try and protect it. Uh, you see a large timber earthen bank. It was outlined originally with post a model and then later with a stone wall. The bank didn't work particularly well, though, because it was breached here and silt from the river poured in and you get a big buildup of silt. Now, the existence of the flood bank and this early material <coughs> and indeed the, the, the line of the puddle shows that the pool that was supposed to be this small thing actually probably extended right across the site. This is the line of the puddle where we found it on the site. Also, the existence of so much Viking material here suggests very much that the actual long fort extended right as far as here and was much, much larger than we previously thought. As we also shall see, uh, the long fort wasn't abandoned. After um, the early period, settlement continued in it. Even when the town was, the Viking town was laid out, we still have houses and settlements in the long fort. So, We've got to start think, stop thinking really of the Viking town as just this little small area here. We had an area out here and we have the, the street that Claire Walsh found down at the Coon many years ago as well. Now, in the, later in the 11th century, we got reclamation fences attempting to push the puddle back. And at the very beginning of the 12th century, we got our first house. Um, a standard type one uh, Viking house or Hibernian Norse house, if you like. Um, 
the area, however, was still prone to floods. And we found the evidence of a large flood, which had actually damaged the house. And after then, the house was rebuilt. There was a whole sequence of houses here, but later disturbance has, has removed them. And all we've got left of, of the later ones are just the, the doors, the deep ones. Where the ground was slightly lower down here on the north, we found the remains of a laneway. It jumped around a bit over time, but it lasted probably up until at least the 14th century. Um, on this side of it here, it's not shown on the plan, there was a whole line of large uh, latrines or toilets which belonged to the properties on Little Ship Street, which is up this way. Now, as I mentioned before, the extent rock ring on the site. These are huge quarries, they're generally about six to eight meters in depth. Um, there's a whole sequence of them. The earliest ones started over here on the west side and they progressed eastwards. And as each one was dug, the material removed uh, the waste was deposited back in the earlier one. And we get a sequence running right the way across. This one is contemporary with some of them. We're not quite sure exactly which, but it's, it's roughly contemporary. Now the fills of these quarries here on the west produce quite a lot of human remains. And we suspect that when they were clearing the, or digging down through subsoil to get to the rock, they probably went through an early graveyard. The latest quarry was this green one up here. Um, it wasn't filled in fully until, until the 14th century. It was an absolute monster of a, of a thing. Uh, its base was nearly 17 metres below uh, modern ground level. It, uh, it's the deepest hole we've ever had to dig. It was full of silt and full of really good, rich, fine assemblage, just wonderful stuff. Now, as I mentioned, uh, disturbance had removed a lot of the medieval material for the, for the northeast corner. And indeed, the whole way along uh, Ship Street here itself, there was no medieval houses surviving. Johnny Ryan or Johnny, Johnny, whatever he is, Johnny found the same sort of thing here. Um, <coughs> bits of medieval pits out the back of the houses, but the houses have been moved. Any, any, the, the later has have removed the early material. We found the same thing here. Um, Chancery Lane itself wasn't established until the 1720s, so there's no medieval uh, structures here. However, there's an open area in the middle of the site, you can see it here on Roke's map, approached by a laneway, still there in the 19th century. And we'd hope that in that we'd find something, and, and indeed we did. When we, were, when we were digging along the cellarage here, underneath the 19th century and 18th century laneway, we found a medieval surface made of cockle shells. Uh, running through. And this laneway led into this area here. Um, it was part of an original wall laid out in the late 13th century here, rest had been robbed out. And in the enclosure, we find a terrace, a curb of stone, and a raised flat area here on which there were a number of buildings and kilns. And then in the lower lying ground, we have cultivated a whole series of ridge and furrow. Um, this the buildings here were in use from the late 13th up to into the 14th century, and then they went out of use, and the whole area just became a garden, cultivated area. Cultivated area. Uh, there are references to uh, a paradise garden in the area in the 14th, 15th century, and this is probably, probably it. The other sort of medieval thing that we found, I suppose, again in this area behind the cellars was a couple of burials. Uh, the upper one, pretty bog standard, cut through by this wall, nothing terribly interesting. But the first, the, the later one, the earlier one, was more interesting. We found the head and shoulders of it when we were doing the chest trenching in the, the trench boxes around the edge. Pretty normal head and shoulders, but then there was remains of two feet, which sort of puzzled us initially because there was no trace of any other bits of body. The mystery got a bit deeper, I suppose, when we got down to his midrib, midriff. There we couldn't find his hands, and then we noticed actually his wrists had been cut See, the wrist bones are cut. And then we got down to his legs and we found his feet had been cut off. And you can see the chops at the end here. And as we were moving the legs, there we found his hands underneath his legs. So what we have here is a punishment burial. Uh, this is Conor McHale's reconstruction. It was a young man in his early 20s. He had his feet cut off, put behind his head, his hands cut off and put under his legs. Uh, such burials are such punishments. There are many references in the medieval period to them, and they're generally associated with someone who insults or gravely insults a, a noble person. They're rare enough. There's a couple in Portugal we know, but they're extremely rare. We also had a huge amount of dog burials. Uh, there were literally dozens of dogs. We had half a dozen cats, 
there was a cow and a horse, a piglet, and rarest of all, a complete cockerel. Um, bones of chick we find chicken bones occasionally, but to get a complete uh, actual skeleton of a chicken or a cockerel is extremely rare. Going through the finds now from all this material, we have the largest collection of early of Viking and medieval shoes that's come up since Wood Key from any site anywhere in, in Ireland. And quite a lot of belts and all that other leather as well, and a load of fabric. Um, we also have quite a collection of post-medieval shoes. With the usual run of uh, belts and fittings, there's lace tags, there's buckles and rings and iron ones, bronze ones, and this lovely uh, 11th century strap tag. Jewelry, silver ring brooch, uh, glass and amber beads, a lignite bead, uh, what's the rock crystal and piece of gold. With a collection, huge collection of pins, with the remains of six ring pins, pretty bog standard apart from this one, the middle one here, which has got a nice bit of decoration. But you also found an antler one, and these are much rarer. There's only one for Mud Key, uh, they're not common at all. We found some very highly decorated pins. This one in particular here is an absolute work of art. It's a stunning pin. There's one stray find from the, an old find from the museum that's something like it, but the decoration doesn't come down the whole way. Here it extends right down the shank, as you can see right down to here. It's an incredible piece of work. We have a huge range of pins of various different types. Uh, we have perforated heads, false kidney ring, crutch headed, undifferentiated, stud headed, uh, spatulated headed, box and baluster headed and then club headed or which are the most uh, new in pin incredibly good nick you can see here you can see you can see the original file marks that the maker left on, on their heads in addition we had some iron pins uh, stick pins we had some bone stick pins and we had this incredible uh, wooden pin with an open mark top very very unusual there were a range of various different bone points and these ant long anther pins, these are huge things, and they were probably for holding a cloak or something like that. A range of combs, um, none of them decorated, so they're not particularly fabulous. Uh, knives and leather scabbards, a lot of them decorated. Toilet implements, tweezers, toothpicks, range of uh, things from, from the house, um, the locks, bits of windows, staples, all sorts of things. Load of bone and bronze mounts. Um, we had quite a few bronze and iron vessels. Only one shard of medieval glass, for some reason, very rare, but a whole clatter of laid turn wooden bowls and, and cups and things like that. There was also this wonderful single piece uh, churn, if you want. Um, this is probably 10th century. It's made it carved as one piece of timber with a separate bottom, and then it's got wrappings around it of. Um, of timber. Uh, we also found a whole load of stays built, buckets, churns and vessels. And rarest of all, we have this bent wood bowl. It's made of little thin strips wrapped around and set in a wooden base. This may be the first medieval example from Ireland. Um, we did find a whole lot of 17th century ones there a few years ago uh, from an apothecary's uh, uh, workshop. We also found a whole lot of little strips like this were probably for making further vessels. Uh, a bit of more bronze, uh, stone mortar, stone lamp, plaster of pottery lamps, usual range of bowl handles, apple corer, hollow bone cylinders, bits of flint, large amount of sewing and weaving material. Uh, these are stone spindle holes, bone ones, bone pin beaters, sewing needles, bronze, bone, iron, shears and scissors, uh, gaming board for playing fox and geese, a couple of counters. Uh, musical instruments, these are tuning pegs, a whistle, buzz bones, writing implements. We have a, a parchment pricker here, and then we have this fantastic wooden stylus with a copper point. Really nicely decorated, and the end has got a little face on it. Really cute. Range of iron tools, pretty bog stand, really, apart from this one. This is a hide scraper. Wallace calls a hide scraper. There's a few from Wood Key. They're, they don't turn up very often at all. I don't think there's any from Waterford, for example. But we found a, a bronze one as well, which is most unusual. With a huge amount of antler waste, uh, waste from working antler. These three pegs, for example, are used for splitting the antler it's, uh, itself. And then we have pegs here that are just for anchors. Whetstones and, their, and clasps. This very intriguing little axle. Uh, it's very, very small, probably from a child's toy cloth seal, weighing scales and weights, 
few horseshoes. Now, there were no horseshoes from the Viking level because Vikings didn't have horseshoes, um, and neither did the horses. Um, Snaffle bit, uh, 10th century uh, a, a prick spur, 13th century rowel spur, bits of Viking ships, boat timbers and nails, um, fishing gear with net weights, net sinkers, and, and hooks. Weaponry then, this is the tip of a late 14th century sword, a load of arrowheads, uh, tanged and socketed up one to nine there, all Viking 11 onwards, or Anglo-Norman. The last one over on the right is a hunting arrowhead. We also found the actual wooden arrow. These are much rarer. Um, this was late 12th century, and you can see on the tip here, the remains of the actual arrowhead itself. We have a piece of Samian ware and a piece of porphyry. These were brought in by pilgrims coming back from Rome, probably in the 11th century. Because we're close to the church, some may even come as far as from Pat St. Patrick's, but there's a whole range of types, two color, line and press, line and press mosaic and relief tiles. Now the 17th century material on the site was less of it really because of the presence of the later cellars, but up in the northwest corner we found the remains of a series of buildings with a garden behind it. Now the garden was most unusual in that it was made up of a whole series of these trenches, narrow trenches cut down very close together, after they'd been dug, they were immediately filled in with lumps of mortar and red brick. And we think there were probably drains or drainage for drainage. They may have put large pots with, with fancy plants on, on top of these to keep them keep them drained. And we found the remains of quite a few pots, including this lovely one here with the face on it. And in the center of the garden, there was a seat made of a, a reused windowsill uh, where you could rest. Up on Ship Street, we only found a teeny bit of 17th century material. There was loads of pits, but actual structures were very rare because the, the 19th, 18th, 19th century sellers had wiped everything out. We found this area here survived up in the northeast corner, and this appears to be the backyard of a tavern. Uh, the finds on this were fantastic. A huge amount of this really good Venetian wine glasses, wine bottles, coins, uh, coin weights, and clay pipes, all dating from the 1680s and 1690s. We had a few spoons as well, there's a nice uh, decorated silver one, De a tankard handle, some of these initials on it, another spoon, and then just a stray find from the site, uh, a gold ring, finger ring, um, badly written as faithful as friendly on, on the inside. We have a huge amount of pottery on the site, that 30 something thousand shards altogether. I haven't said anything about the medieval pottery because uh, I could talk all day about it. The post-medieval pottery we've been experimenting with actually drawing it in colour uh, to give it a better idea because it's it's colourful pottery and doing black and white drawings really doesn't show it up. So with Conor McHale has been working on actually reproducing the pots in the original colours. We have a vast assemblage of clay pipes, I think it's about 5,000 or something like that. It's mind-boggling. A uh, huge number of 17th century ones, quite a few of them with stamps. This is a group of late 17th century locally made pipes. There's, oh, this must be about thousand of them. A bunch of 18th century Dutch pipes. An early 19th century pipe with green maize on it. This is quite unusual. With a vast quantity of uh, 19th century Dublin made pipes. I think we have about 15, 16 makers represented. And these are just two uh, late 19th century French pipes, which are kind of cute. Now the cellars. Uh, Chancery Lane itself wasn't laid down until about 1720. And it was gradually developed between about 1720 and 1740. Ship Street, which had been early, was redeveloped in the early 18th century as well. So all these buildings started life in, in the 18th century. Um, I could talk for weeks just on the cellar, so I'm not going to say very much at all. Except said that this one here, this these two houses here were taken over in the 1840s, and this was added this big building here, become part of a Dublin Metropolitan Police Station, one of the earliest police stations in the British Isles. And from it, we found the remains of a few bits and pieces, the cap badge, numbers, there's a carriage license plate, um, and a spoon. Now the sellers themselves produced a huge amount of material. Uh, we do have some photographs of the original buildings, um, and they were pretty, in, originally, uh, Chancery Lane was, uh, had the Lord Chancellor's mansion on it. It was a, it was a, it was a prestigious street and meet it, it, at an early stage, but like anywhere else, it went downhill very quick. Now they said that the sellers produced a huge amount of material. Uh, you name it, we found it. 
Here's a few small number of the hundreds of buttons, collection of bone material. We also found industrial uh, materials from the 18th and 19th century. Uh, you know, these uh, signs, uh, enamel signs from the early 20th century. This one for someone called Howard Clark, uh, Eden Key. Um, these are bone pin blanks. We had a huge amount of these large crucibles and we had kilns and refuse. Uh, from William Curtis, who was a brass founder up in Chancery Lane, huge amount of material. And down on one property on Ship Street, there were a whole load of glass crucibles with, with glass in them. We also had cupels for cupellations. So there's a whole lot of interactivity. Now, shortly after 1800, the east side of Chancery Lane, or Ship Street, sorry, became a military barracks uh, attached to Dublin Castle, with big military presence. And not surprisingly then, we found quite a few military finds. We have a cannon worm for cleaning out cannon. This is a badge of the Royal Artillery. This is the silver tip of a swagger cane that had been held by an officer in the Royal East Kent Regiment. Uh, bullets and cartridges, and probably most poignant of all, um, this World War I era uh, ID tag from 7402 Private Edward Whitfield, who was in the 4th Battalion of the Royal Irish Regiment. Um, and the RC indicates that he was Catholic. Now, I've just gone a very quick run through that. Um, there's an awful, we're still working, there's still a little bit more to do. But really, Anything like that is a huge site but that requires a really big and good team. And we had an absolutely fantastic team. A few, most of them here, a few members, notables missing. And really, I suppose we have to thank these people for all the, the treasures and the things that I've, I've shown you today. Thank you.